as you were saying, it, it goes like one bit towards creepy. That, yeah. le that length of head, you know yeah. what I mean? You're like, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if I saw you in the local paper for something you should have done. <laughs> on the wanted sign at the train station. Good. Okay, so we're doing the international generic. So this okay. is going to be going right back to the beginning, covering a lot of the same ground. Sure. See if people haven't heard anything from you yet. Okay. So, uh, what can you tell us about Billy Lee? Uh, he is a he's a cult leader. Um, he is a, a very uh, manipulative human being. Uh, he's quite charismatic, uh, which is essential, I think, for you know, in my research, looking at cult figures. And, and people that manage to, you know, control the masses of people and get, you know, many, many people to follow them off the path of normal travel into some, you know, off the grid strange sort of existence. Um, it, 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 he, there was a, it had to be a charisma, it had to be a sort of a, a sadistic sort of sense of humor, and, uh, but also it was, you know, a true sort of manipulation and, 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 a, and a power trip, you know. He's a sociopath, the guy. He's self-absorbed and he may, you know, claim to be helping and giving the answer, but that's just an opportunity for him to feel responsible for, you know, helping everybody, which in turn is just a big old boost for his ego. Um, we wanted to highlight the sort of toxic masculinity in the world, and, and so there was overtly sexual attitude about the guy. He, I think, is probably a sex addict. He's probably an addict, in, addicted to power, um, addicted to control. Um, so the way he kind of moves and speaks, there was I wanted the sort of a musica musicality to his the cadence, and have it be sort of somewhat alluring. And then he has his shirt open most of the time, and and again that was about really just kind of power you know it was about this is it. I'm self-assured confidence and I'm going to put this right in your face too and he was in people's space he had, there was no um, care for personal space of others he would go right up in there and speak that little bit closer than normal and 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 and, and say all sorts of things that people didn't want to hear but often were true you know he was able to kind of locate and pinpoint that vulnerability and exploit it and can you set the scene for us in terms of what is Bad Times at the El Royale? Uh, the movie is set in uh, a, a hotel where seven strangers meet with seven secrets and, and they're all searching and uh, searching for something, an answer, uh, an object. They're running from something. They're ultimately trying to find out and figure out who they are and what their place in the world is. Um, but at you know the same time these things all collide, and which you know it ends up being the recipe for a pretty chaotic scenario, and um, it's violent, it's 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 heartbreaking. Um, there's there's humour when you shouldn't laugh, <laughs> um, and an incredible soundtrack, and the film is one of the most beautifully shot films I've ever seen. And how did this role come your way? I'd known Drew Goddard from Cabin in the Woods that uh, we worked on years ago. We'd stayed in contact, um, and I was just waiting for an opportunity to work with him again. This film came up. I heard it was out there. Um, immediately rang my agent and him and said, why haven't you offered this to me? <laughs> and um, I read it and, and straight away said, yep, let's go, and, and, and never looked back. And how did you approach creating the character who is, in many respects, the villain mm -hmm. of the film. Uh, the, a lot of research on cult figures and, and trying to understand, you know, that no one, you, you can't just play evil, you know, like you, he has to believe he's doing some good in some way, or what is the justification for that? And, and for me, it was, you know, whether he thought he was helping people or whether he was just addicted to the idea that he was helping people, it's probably truer. Um, and so, so we, 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 I wanted to create someone that, that had a charisma that was alluring and attractive, um, a physicality and a movement that was incredibly confident and, and at ease with things, you know, there was a sort of fluidity to the way I wanted to move and the cadence vocally. Um, 
and then it was about you know collaborating with Drew on set and seeing how far we could push it and how unexpected this could be and and my goal was to try and have something that that he had written and he had spent years building in his head I wanted to, to surprise him that was my objective and the first read through he said ah can we talk and he said I don't know about the the the, the voice or the sort of I'm not sure and I said yeah, trust me Ernest, trust me this is I've been working on this for a while and and um I said look give me a day of doing it and by the end of it if you don't think it's working I'll do whatever you want and we shot for a day and he said I was wrong this is great let's go and um you know there are many occasions also where he said no no, no that's that's wrong I'm right you know and so it was a it was a it was a wonderful open ended sort of collaboration you know where anything was offered up and accepted and played with and tried and explored and is that how the dance scene came about the dance scene was not in the movie uh, or in the script it was basically we'd been on that set for sort of seven or eight days and it drew the, the song came on deep purple song and I just started kind of moving my hips and you know, I, I, I think, on, yeah, on one level I had an awareness about well, what's the character doing at this point, and I think he's just kind of just screwing with everybody, you know. It's, it's, it's basically like, you know, the, the, everyone knows there is violence bubbling under the surface, and instead of sort of telling everyone this is what's about to happen, here he is dancing and eating cherry pie, which is <clears throat> incredibly unnerving and unsettling. Um, and it was sort of, you know, overtly sort of sexual and offensive. <laughs> and, and I think that that sort of just is who that guy is too. Many of your scenes are with Kaylee. Mm. How, um, can you talk a little bit about her as an actor? She's incredible. Um, amazing vulnerability, um, wide-eyed sort of awareness and, 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 and sort of, constantly searching for what else and, 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 and just consuming everything around her. You know, she's at that point in her career where it all is so new and <clears throat> I've seen, you know, people, and I've probably done it, you know, early in your career, kind of thinking you've got the answers and coming in with it. She certainly had an opinion and, and a well-prepped character, but was w uh, eyes wide open, ready just to go, okay, what else can we explore? What else could this be? what's our collaboration and, and it kept sort of checking in with me about why, what is it they like about each other, what do you think they give one another or, or complete and, and you know on one hand the film you could look at it and say that you know my character is controlling this, 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 this young woman but we kind of came to the understanding that actually she kind of runs the show, he is lost without her which is his, you know, she is his motivation for coming in and doing what he does in such a sort of violent way and, and an abrupt sort of dramatic way. And at the other end of the scale, you have Jeff Bridges, mm -hmm. um, who has made some of the greatest films of yeah. all time. Talk about the experience of working with him. Oh, it's so wonderful. You know, I've worked with a few people of that level, you know, where, um, all you hope for is that they're kind and open and welcoming because, um, you know, you have these people up on a pedestal, you know, I admire them so much and, and, and have been such a fan of his and, and, you know, he's one of my heroes and I'm like, don't let me down, don't break my heart, you know, and the first day on set he came up, big hug, kiss on the cheek and said, I'm so excited to work with you, it's going to be so much fun and so instantly that was just like, such a kind of relief um, and yeah, the kind of you know you're working with people like that and midway through your coverage you're kind of watching going oh, how's he doing that that's interesting hang on the camera's on me I've got to get back on track you know they're distracting how, how good they are and they'd all been going a few months by the time you joined mm. what was that first day on set like tricky you know because you um, I'm in the middle of a, a four month shoot now, I'm oh, sorry, I'm in the, uh, three months into a four month shoot at the moment. And it's kind of the worst time in a film because it's right when everyone can see the finish line but it's still four weeks away. And you kind of, 
everything's just feeling too familiar. You've had all the conversations you're going to have. You're tired. You're exhausted. You just want to, you know, you just want to finish. And I came in on month three of a four-month shoot and was well aware that that's how everyone would probably be feeling. So I was certainly a little, you know, a little nervous <laughs> coming in then. And, um, but I don't know, just sort of, it probably forced me to go a little bigger with everything and just kind of, I don't know, lift the, the energy or try to kind of go, okay, you've really got to contribute here, you know, especially at this point in the game and this point in the schedule. And, um, and it was, that was a lot of fun. I don't know, if I'd shot sort of week one, I might not have had that kind of energy. I don't know. And you was that a little bit like going back in time? Was it a sense of a reunion with Drew, who you'd stayed yeah. in touch with, but this was mm -hmm. the first time you've worked together again? Yeah, it was in, in the best way. I, I have yearned to work in Vancouver since Cabin. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, I just love it. I love the combination of this is big, beautiful city and the food and the people, but nature, you're surrounded by the most stunning lakes and mountains and forests and um, so, there was conversations about it shooting somewhere else at one point, and I said, I can't do it if it's shooting at that particular location because I've just spent a long time there and I can't do it. And um, not that he moved it for me, but I think I g g gave him a pretty good pitch about, come on, where do you want to be? Here or there. Um, <clears throat> so it was great. You know, I drive past little restaurants and things and places I hung out. What the cabin was eight years ago, I think. And, and it had this sort of wave of nostalgia and, and, and memories of, oh my God, this was when I was doing one of my first jobs and here I am at a different point in my career. And um, yeah, pretty cool. Would you say Cabin was a transformational moment for your career? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I'd done maybe, I'd done Star Trek just before and that was certainly kind of opened up yeah, everything for me. And then when I was doing Cabin, that was a, another big step for me. And while I was shooting Cabin, I was auditioning for Thor. And Drew and Joss Whedon spoke with um, Kevin, uh, with, with Ken Branner, who was directing Thor 1, and said, you should meet this guy. He's, he's, he's like, we think, you know, he should be Thor and so on. And so, yeah, if I hadn't have done that film, Thor might not have happened. And, and um, <clears throat> so hugely transformational and, 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 and threw me into the game. <laughs> and you've talked about your collaboration with Drew in creating Billy Lee. Mm -hmm. How much detail did that go into? So were you involved with his look, for example? You've talked about the mm. voice and the rhythm and the kind of physicality. Yeah. How much detail did you go into in terms of creating? Uh, a lot, yeah. We had many conversations about who the character was, you know. Um, so much was available for me on for me on the page. Um, it's such a wonderful script, um, but it was about kind of just sitting with the character for a number of months before we started shooting. And 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 it's interesting. My wife always says, you know, the moment I sort of start to go down the rabbit hole of trying to find a character, she's like, okay, I'll see you in a couple of months, you know, <laughs> and, and not in some mad sort of method process, but I'll tend to be sort of listening to her with 50% of my attention <laughs> and then the other portions kind of thinking about the character and so on. Um, but the look, yeah, yeah, we talked about the, the you know, what's gonna represent who this guy is, you know, the sort of sexuality, the power, the, 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 um, the, 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 the period in time, you know, the, that period in time, the, the expression and the freedom to express or the want and need to express. And, and ha have a greater opinion and say in life and not be controlled. Uh, everything about him sort of, I think, represented that. You know, he wasn't going to conform to anyone else's rules. And was the hair natural or a wig? It's a wig. I had uh, Luca Vanella, who's the, the, best, the best wig man in the business, and, and Drew said to me, can you grow your hair by this date? And I said, no, because I'm shooting another movie where it's very short. And he said, oh, okay, well, we'll just maybe the character has short hair. And I said, oh, I could get a wig. And he said, I'm not dealing with wigs. They, they never look good and so on. And I said, this is not your regular hair guy. This guy, Luca, is, um, is, is the best there is. And then I said, trust me, if you don't like it, we'll rip it off and whatever. And 
it, Luca, I think, became Drew's favorite person on the set. <laughs> you know, the amount of times he, it, no one knew it was a wig, you know. Like I did, I, the at a rap party, I came in with my short hair and everyone was like, oh my God, for, for four weeks now, I thought it, that was your hair. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a Luca Vanilla talent. He's sitting over there. Give him a little a nod. <laughs> um, what do you think this film represents in terms of original cinema and the importance of original cinema? I think it's, you know, being able to take our time to, to, to <clears throat> build characters. And, you know, we all have a large dose of sort of ADD these days and inability to sort of sit still and listen for too long. And <clears throat> this kind of forces you to go, no, 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 just sit down, watch, pay attention, you know. And I find the second, third time you watch it, you notice more and more details. Um, and that's what I loved about it, <clears throat> that it wasn't relying on big special effects and explosions to sort of keep you invested. You were truly, uh, I think, you know, infatuated with who these people were and trying to kind of peel back the layers to, to <clears throat> what they were after or what they were afraid of or what uh, their, their vulnerabilities were. And, um, we don't see that very often. I mean, the first time I read the script, immediately that spoke to me in such a way and I thought, oh, I'm yearning to do something like this. And I do think an audience is yearning to see more films like this too. Great. Cool. Lovely. Thank you so much <coughs> for your time. I'm sorry to Thank make you repeat you. everything over and over.